Hey guys, welcome to the Ascent Running YouTube channel. This is going to be our first series. I've got Mike here with us today, and he is going to be training for his first half marathon. Mike ran in college. He ran the 10K in cross country, and he ran up to 5K on the track, but he's never run anything further. And so now he's going to train for his first half marathon in the fall, right around the Boston Marathon time. And I'm going to help coach him. I'm excited about it, yet also terrified. Uh, Chris Doe scares the living crap out of me, um, not just as a coach, but as an individual as well. So this will be interesting. Oh, I'm always known for my warm, fuzzy appeal. <laughs> uh, fuzzy, warm, I don't know. I, I don't really picture you as somebody with a soul, my man, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> hey, hey, I got a baby girl now. I got to reform myself. All right, that's fair. That's fair. Maybe I can trust your judgment a little bit more now, or, or that just means incredibly less. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm excited. Uh, just a little background on me um, coming from a middle distance background and then leaving uh, college. Chris has been my coach pretty much since I graduated. Um, it, it's uh, kind of shifted my whole mindset on training from more speed stuff to a lot more long distance stuff. I've been doing longer tempos than I ever have in my entire life before. Um, and this will be a, a nice way to kind of get this going because I'm basically going to be starting a training cycle over entirely again. So I'm excited to see um, where that goes. Yeah, to set the table in the recent months, Mike was training and he was training quite successfully. His longest tempo before the previous cycle was about 30 minutes long. And we pushed that barrier all the way up to around 40 minutes. Right after that, he decided to go and bust a tendon for the first time and decide that, hey, it really hurts. Maybe I should do another 10 miles on it. That's not always the right answer. And Mike is now paying the price for that. He has taken three to four weeks off, if not more, Mike, uh, I think we're at almost six weeks now, man, with some running sprinkled in just to test it out because it's been feeling better while walking around, but running still, it's it's tender. And it's uh, like I was telling you before, it's an injury I haven't really experienced before. So it's a learning experience for sure. Right. And one of those learning experiences is you listen to your coach who's had many injuries when he tells you to slow down when you come back. So in the past week, Mike went out for a 25 minute run. I said, fantastic. We're going to slow it down. So we're gonna do a walk jog where we walk for three minutes and then jog for three minutes. And Mike said, wait, no, that is way too humiliating. I cannot be seen out there walking in short shorts. I'm just not that kind of guy. Obviously it's I told him to put long tights underneath his short shorts and then he would be fine. But mainly the reason why we wanna do the walk jog is so that he can do back to back days without having the tendons slide backwards. And so it can get some activity each day, but at the same time, we're not pushing it so hard that he is going to run into trouble down the road. As he is right now, having run four days in a row, he is now starting to feel the tendon. So we have to take a day off. Uh, yeah, I'll second that. Listen to your coach, everybody. Um, <laughs> this guy, uh, I give him a lot of crap, but he knows that he definitely knows what he's talking about. And uh, I mean, it's gotten me in shape pretty quickly. It, like I said, it's been a bummer not to run for the past six weeks, but I'm not super worried about it. Um, I usually get back into shape relatively quickly, anywhere from like two weeks to a month, which uh, in the grand scheme of things isn't really all that long. So uh, I'm kind of excited once again to give this new distance training shot. Yeah, and to be a better coach to everyone out there, obviously, uh, what I did was before I finished running as a professional runner, I managed to get almost every soft tissue injury there is, hips and below, so that when you get hurt, I am there to help you with my expertise uh expertise which is obviously non-medical advice it's just what has worked for me and what the experts have told me to do in the past so first thing we want to do when we are planning a training cycle is we want to know what your end race is going to be both what that race is in terms of which race specifically but also the distance you're training for because if you're training for a mile versus a marathon the training is going to look very different so Mike has chosen a half marathon, his first one, inaugural half marathon. And which one are we looking at this time, Mike? So, I mean, longer down here, I think there's a half in St. George uh, kind of towards October. So that's kind of what I'm going to be looking for. St. George is a little bit further south of me and Utah's about four hours away. But um, more often than not, no, not, not even more often than not. Um, that course is known to be much faster because you start at a higher elevation, you end almost 1500 feet lower. So 
It's a fun one for me because I cannot scan hills. Uh, if anybody knows me, that's that's a fact. I will complain about them every step of the way. But this one seems like a good option. Uh, and Christo too. I don't think uh, I've ever used the word Christo as a verb before running with the guy. We, we would talk about how we're going to Christo this uphill. <laughs> yeah, I found out that once he left Charlotte and moved out to Salt Lake City, he turned my name into a verb. And that was to let's go up this hill very slowly. Because normally when I ran with him, I would just get dropped on the uphill. And I'd catch up sooner or later once we hit the crest of the hill. Yep. But more often than not, I, I loved your style of uphill. And yes, that has turned to a verb. We take it very slowly. We Christo the hill and we make it to the top, which can sometimes be three or 4,000 feet straight of like two miles. So like, yeah. Well, that's just crazy talk. I know. Insane. I run with these ultra guys sometimes and I don't understand how they do it, man. They just blow their quads out and just like psychos man yeah well one thing we're going to want to talk about is the elevation change in your half marathon this might be a conversation for later on down the road but if you are losing 1500 feet in elevation and it's a fairly steady downhill we're going to want to practice running downhill for longer periods of time because if you are not accustomed to it and you go into a race running downhill for a long period of time your quads are going to blow out it's actually going to be harder than running flat or uphill because your quads are not used to going downhill for that period of time. You can find that somewhat in Boston. There is a half marathon and marathon around Charlotte in the North Carolina uh, foothills. That's called the Scream. The half marathon is 13 miles straight downhill. In the marathon, you lose over 2000 feet in elevation. And by the time you hit 20 miles and then uphill, people are just celebrating the fact that they get to run uphill again. So if you're losing 1500 feet in a half marathon, we're definitely gonna find you some practice running downhill for a sustained period of time. Now that might mean running uphill for a sustained period of time to begin with, or if you have some friends that can drop you up off up a mountain and then run down, that's also another alternative. That would probably be my favorite thing because boy, going up these things in this area really sucks, so. I can understand that. Okay, now the second thing we want to take a look at after figuring out which race we are going to end on and peak for at the end of the training cycle. So we want to take a look at the other races you're going to do in your training cycle so that we can plan for them when creating the training plan um, with all the weekly mileage and weekly workouts. And the reason for this is we want to make sure that you have a down week, the week of the race, so that you can feel nice and fresh for that race but on the other hand, we're not taking off so much time that you're resetting, that you are losing the overall momentum in the training plan that builds up to that final race. So Mike has been kind enough to shoot me over his racing plan. And let's take a look at it. Today is Monday, the 19th of 2021. This is going to be the start of his training plan. And we are going to start very slowly with Mike. With most people, we would be able to start a little faster. However, he is still coming back from injury. So we need to start with a walk jog and we will build that up until we graduate to full running. Once we've had a couple weeks of full running, then we're going to progress the workouts. So his training plan is gonna be a little bit slower than most people's training plan because most people can just start off with a run, um, running the whole week. So Mike's first race he put on the schedule was the Provo City Half Marathon, which is seven days from now. Mike will not even be running 13 miles seven days from now, let alone five miles in a row seven days from now. We're going to hey, scratch that one off the list. I think <laughs> it was a little adventurous to think he could go from three minutes on, three minutes off to a half marathon in one week. Hey, man, it's all about uh, the drive, motivation, and the ambition. Maybe I'm for it. Or, or I'm just for rupturing my entire tendon as opposed to an acute rupture. So, um, yeah, we'll scratch that one off. Yeah, we'll take that one off the list. <laughs> Same thing goes for the one, one month from now. That one's off the list, too. You're not racing anytime soon. Because the first thing we want to do is we want to build base fitness. There's no sense in racing a half marathon, a 10K when you haven't even built up to the point where you're doing 30 to 40 minute workouts. The first half of the season is fairly similar for most racing distances, say 10K through the marathon 
most cycles start with tempos, fart licks, and hill repeats thrown in there every so often. And the reason for that is we want to get you in basic fitness. Uh, we want to do two things. First, we want to build up your fitness and get you in better shape. But uh, the other thing we need to do, and, and this is the biggest part, is we need to get your body used to working. If you are training for a half marathon, which is anywhere from an hour, if you're an incredible elite runner, to much more than that, you need to be able to do a workout of at least 30 to 40 minutes before you can run a competent half marathon. And that's something where you can sustain your goal race pace for the duration of the marathon without resorting to drastic changes in pace. The ideal way to run your fastest race is at a very even pace or an even to negative pace, meaning the second half is faster than the first half. All world records 1500 meters on up have been set running negatively. And so this is what we want to do in a race too. And so to do that, you have to be able to have your body adjusted for working for a longer period of time. With Mike, since he was a collegiate athlete and a wannabe pro runner. Wannabe, wow, that was uh, that's a little harsh. I was sponsored for two years, Chris, though. Give me some cred. <laughs> All right. All right. So Mike made the indoor national meet out in Albuquerque. He went out there and, and promptly forgot about running and just got starstruck by every single person he saw out there. It was exciting. It was exciting. It was, uh, it was a uh, next level, man. It was, uh, it was cool to race some of the people that I had looked up to. And if I were to go back, it would be a lot different. They wouldn't necessarily be stars in my eyes. They would just be, uh, competitors. But that first time is, is, is an amazing shock value, and it's honestly incredibly exciting. So anyways, didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, it was, a, it was an awesome experience, and I would go back in a heartbeat. No, I can, I can definitely relate with Mike. The first time I made USA Outdoor National Championships was a lot different from the last time I raced at an outdoor championships. It, it, it goes from being that thing you've always dreamed about, you can't believe you're there, to you don't believe you belong there, to hey, this is my jam. I'm out there to beat these people down. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty cool experience if, if you can get there. So since Mike has a base of sustained running underneath him, he has done long and hard workouts before he's going to be ending up at a higher distance level and a higher time level than someone who might be training hard for the first time. This is the sort of thing where if you do a second training cycle, you'll be able to do more than you did in the first training cycle. Mike here ran four years in college and has run post collegiately as well. So he has many cycles under his belt. So he's going to be able to do a lot more than someone who is training seriously for their first time or is stepping up in distances for the first time since he's got such a big base underneath him. And so we'll be looking at getting his tempo runs well above 40 minutes by the end, which is going to be a shock to him. Yep, he's already he's already thinking about that pain cave he's gonna get to go in. Although oh, it won't man. be too bad because for tempo runs, it's not a workout where you wanna end up hands on knees, dead tired at the end of it. A tempo run is something where you wanna be able to do five more minutes at that pace once you finish without the effort level going up drastically. And I will say, Christo, uh, you were super efficient that last one. It, it, it seemed to be, and one of my favorite things about this, and I don't know if this was something that you picked up on, but every single time that we had a new increment and a new length of a tempo, it was almost like the perfect amount for me. It was like, okay, I, probably, I could have kept that for another three to five minutes, but boy, that really kind of made me work. Um, and every single week, I thought that that was my limit. And then the next week, even though it was only a couple minutes longer, like I was fine. And, and I love that. I, I thought it was like really cool to see that I previously thought that a significantly shorter tempo run was at my limit before. And then two weeks later, I was running seven to 10 minutes farther and I was able to sustain it. So it was, uh, it was a cool thing to watch. Yes, it, it was not as cool to watch from my end because I got a heavy dose of the complaining every single week. <laughs> There was the, you do this. I won't make it. I'm going to collapse. There's no way my body is built for this. 
<laughs> oh, it's accurate. And you know what? What's funny is I still don't think it is. But when we got up to 43 minutes, uh, I was like, okay, maybe I'm a little bit of a distance runner now. But no, man, you're still full of it. I, I'll tell you that <laughs> until day one. I'm sorry, until the last day we ever start running, man. I'm, <laughs> Christo, this is bull, and I'm not fit for this. And I was an 800 meter guy in college, man. This is insanity. And then I went and go and and and, it, and I did it. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And anyways, you know what happens if you go out there and you don't hit the pace as I tell you to when you go out there and do it and you tell me you can't do it. Uh, if I don't hit the paces, I'm... yeah, I'm, I'm going to go tell you to go, go run 20 minutes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> then we're going to come back and start over from scratch and do it right. <laughs> oh my God. That was a, that's a scarring experience as well. I I've never wanted to restart a workout again ever since that day. Yeah. Well, if you do it right the first time, yeah, yeah. Well, the cool, but you know what's funny is that you can't because I'll be back at the house and I'll be cooled down by the time I even tell you that I'm done. So. Yeah, I know. It just turns into tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's almost worse. That's almost worse. Yeah, I know. Just gives you extra ah, so, incentive. So basically, you're just telling all these people that you're just a terrible human being. Well, if that's what gets you faster. Now, I do tailor my training plans and my coaching to the individual. And when you get someone as whiny as Mike is, this is just the route you have to go down. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, well, Hey man, it was working, whatever it was as whiny as I will continue to be. It was working. It was working. Okay. All right. Let's continue on down the road in July on the week of July 26th, you have two races down. One is the Jurassic Run 5K, and the other is the Run Wild 5K and 10K. Now, for a half marathon, 5K is just a little bit short. This is the only spot in the training cycle it might be appropriate, and that being the first race. So 5K is a little bit short for training for a half marathon. So for this one, I would recommend that we do the Run Wild 10K. And the reason is you're just using slightly different systems when you're doing the 5K versus the 10K. 10K, you gotta get out there, you gotta hit your pace and you gotta stick it for a long period of time. 5K, you're kind of burning on that edge the whole time where you're constantly pushing, you're never quite relaxed because you have to keep pushing and find that edge the whole time, which is a very different edge than you're gonna find in a half marathon. So for your first race, let's look at the Run Wild 10K. And why, so maybe you can help me understand this, Christo. Why would you not want to sprinkle some 5K in there to maybe work on some turnover for finishing a, a half marathon? Like what would be uh, the lack of benefit from that? Does that make sense? I understand your question. You're not gonna like the answer. Oh boy. 10K is your turnover. Oh dear God, <laughs> why? Oh. You're a distance runner now, Mike. You're running a half marathon. Oh boy. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I can. And don't worry. You will have some turnover in your workouts. We're going to be running hard thousands, hard mile repeats. So you're going to get that speed in there. You know, a hard thousand is the shortest increment we're going to be running in a half marathon training cycle. This half marathon is about 21 kilometers. So if you're running a hard 1K, that's your finishing speed right there. So we're going to work on that. And you're also going to have strides to work on your turnover. And those are going to be your chances to really kind of go after things and get that leg turnover and get that speed you're looking for. Okay. Good. You got to keep in mind that you're no longer a miler, no longer a 5k runner. If we're stepping up to the half marathon, we need to make those adjustments both in training and in racing. So the next two races you have on the schedule are the week of August 9th. And that's two weeks after your last race. One is a trail 10K and the other is a half marathon. Now, what I'm gonna say here is that you could do these races. Two weeks apart is the bare minimum to separate races. However, I would say let's skip these and just get back into training. For your first half marathon cycle, uh, we've got some other races on the schedule coming up. Those might be a better option. Now. You mentioned that the trail 10 K you put that on the schedule because you thought that was really neat. Um, in a situation like this, there is an alternative we can do. You know, if you've got a race that a bunch of your friends are doing, that's part of a series that you're trying to run, 
or that you hear is really neat and you want to do it. One thing you can do is you can schedule it into the week as a workout. Now, generally the workout you want to have as the race is your tempo run. So for that weekend, instead of racing it, what you can do is still compete in the race, but do it as a workout and do it at the workout effort levels. So just because it's listed as a tempo run, you don't go out there and then run as hard as you possibly can at it because then that's a race. So what you can do if you don't want to have another race on the schedule, but you still want to do that race for whatever the reason is, is you can make it your workout for the week. Now that will make you readjust the weekly schedule. So instead of having your workouts, maybe Monday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday, what you'll do is you'll have one of those workouts on the weekend and you'll have your long run earlier in the week in, in the middle of the week so that you have time to have that workout on the weekend without screwing everything's up. Alternatively, if it's a Saturday race, you can have your long run Sunday and keep things as they are. So for this one, I would recommend we take the half marathon off the schedule and then you choose to do the trail 10 K either as a workout or we skip it all together. And I'll leave that one up to you. That's your call. No, you, I know what you're going to say about the next one. <laughs> so the next weekend that Mike has races on the schedule is six weeks from his first 10 K and four weeks from the trail 10 K that he may or may not do. Now he's got two races on there. One is something that he would love to do and is not going to do. And that's a mile race. There's a time and place for mile races. And it is not when you're training for a half marathon. It's just a little too short, a little too abrupt. Your legs are not ready for it. And if you deviate from your half marathon training to prepare your legs for a mile race, then you're sacrificing your half marathon training. So while you could do that, it's just not optimum for your half marathon training. And that's completely up to you. The other race is a half marathon. Now this would be a great time for a half marathon in the training cycle. Here's why. First, the half marathon is an appropriate time after his previous race. In this case, it's six weeks. That is plenty of time. I used to race three to four weeks apart and that worked out very well for me. You also have to find out what works well for you. Three to four weeks is fairly standard. You can do less often if you like, that's not an issue six weeks that's just fine so that's fine the second reason why it's great is it's four weeks before his goal race when you're racing a half marathon or a mar marathon i always recommend racing four to six weeks out from your goal race you can do three weeks but that's kind of a little close and the reason why we want to have this race is because nothing prepares you for race pain other than race pain getting out there going through the motions, pre-race, making sure you have your routines worked out, what you do before the race, what you eat, when you stretch, when you warm up, when you go to the bathroom, everything is something we wanna work out before your final race. On your final race day, there should be nothing new. Everything you eat has already been pre-planned, it's bland, you know exactly how your body is gonna work. I had another athlete on his YouTube show, Chris Mako, he was going for an Olympic trial qualifier marathon, and he decided to have some questionable Chinese food the day before. Oh, that's never, never fun. <laughs> the amount of time he spent in the porta potty that race was more than the amount of time he missed the Olympic trial standard by. Oh, that is brutal. RIP Chris Mako. Sorry, man. Yep. Seeing as he was my high school teammate and I know how much he liked to eat food right before practice, this didn't entirely surprise me either though. Oh man, dude, you got, gotta love yourself some nice Chinese food for a race. Oh yeah, he would show up to practice in high school and be like, oh God, I just ate three slices of pizza. This is gonna suck. Well, like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, we always looked at him like, what are you doing, man? He's like, but it was free pizza. That's hard to turn down. I, I don't know, free pizza? Yeah, man. I mean, ask him one time how he chose which colleges he was going to go to. It's whoever gave him the most free stuff on his college visits. Hey, man, he's a man of simple needs, a man of simple tastes. I mean, I totally understand. I mean, it's hard to turn down pizza. Even when, even when it's bad pizza, it's good pizza. It's pizza. Yeah, which is better than no pizza. 
better than no pizza. Yeah. Well, that's fair. I highly recommend the pizza up in New Haven, Connecticut. That is some fine stuff. Dude, recommend it. We'll put that link in the description below where you can get pizza <laughs> up in Connecticut. <laughs> so so what you're telling me is that like no no mile. No no one mile. Yeah, I've already crossed the mile off your list. It's there. It's gone. It's like it never existed because it never should have existed on a half marathon training plan. Right. Okay. So we're going to talk about your last race now, St. George half marathon. It's your last race. What we're going to do is we're going to spend the last couple of weeks before that race peaking. What does that mean? Your mileage is going to start coming down. Your workouts are going to start getting shorter, but what it does not mean is your regular run paces are going to stay the same. You're not going to hammer away on them because you feel good. You're not going to go out and take them very slowly because you want to be super fresh for the end of the race. Since we're bringing down your mileage and your workout quantities, if you go slower on your other stuff as well, you're just going to go flat and you're not going to feel great on race day. You don't need to worry about adjusting any of your, your workout effort levels or your regular run effort levels, because everything that we're doing re by reducing the quantity of weekly mileage and workout volume is going to take care of making you feel fresh and ready to go on race day. So that's what the taper is. Okay, so let me ask you some questions real quick. Ask me away, my man. Right, so we got the racing schedule figured out. Okay. Next thing we wanna do is I need to ask you some basic questions. How ask many days away. a week do you wanna run? Six. Now, this is something personal to you. The minimum generally in a training plan is four days a week. The reason for that is you don't wanna have two days off in a row. Uh, after two days off in a row, your aerobic gains start declining exponentially. We want to avoid that. So to have a weekly schedule where you don't have two days off in a row, you need to run four days. Pretty simple. The max is probably about seven days and five of those being doubles. I don't think anyone's going to get there. I did that as a professional. It wasn't the most pleasant thing to do. So Mike, being a working professional, he is, in quotes, we're gonna have him cap that one run a day. So the maximum for him is seven, the minimum is four. Mike, where do you wanna fall on that scale from four to seven? Would love to run six days a week. Okay, six days a week. So we're gonna have one day being off? Yep. Okay. Now, do you wanna do any cross training? Cross training could be biking, swimming, ellipticaling, yoga, lifting, whatever it is. Lifting for sure. Okay, how many days a week do you want to lift? Two times. Okay, all right, we'll put in two lifts during the week. Now, number of workouts, since you're running six days a week, the options are one or two days a week. Now, a workout is something more than a regular run. A workout is a tempo, a fart lake, speed work, hill repeats, intervals, that sort of thing. Do you want one or two? Two. Okay. So, two workouts a week, now let's go into the weekly schedule. First question is what day of the week do you wanna do your long run? Uh, either Saturday or Sunday. I, I say that with hesitancy just because the groups that I run with kind of run both days. So like sometimes it'll switch. <laughs> let's, let's say Saturday because I think that's when most of them run. Okay, then let's put it down for Saturday. Now the optimum spacing with workouts if you are doing a Saturday long run would be a Monday workout and a Thursday workout. Does that work for you? Do you want something different? Uh, that works perfect. Okay. Now, what day of the week are we looking to take off? Uh, if it doesn't matter to you, I would advise Friday because that's the day between your primary workout and your long run. Well, let's do that. Okay. Now, some people want to take the weekend off. Some people want to have a weekday off. So it's up to you which day you want to take off. Um, the recommendation is the day between the workout and long run so that you feel fresh and recovered for the long run. Yeah, let's do that Friday. Now for your lifting, do you want to stack lifting on top of your workouts? Do it on the same day. Preferably. I feel like that was always what I, uh, had with a successful formula in college. It was kind of on the same days of workouts, was lifting, so it was just an overall hard day. Okay, now the main thing to do when you are stacking the workouts and the lift is that the primary activity comes first and then the secondary one comes second. 
So running always comes before lifting on those days. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about mileage. What kind of mileage do you want to build up to for the peak in this training cycle? Ooh, I'm not 23 years old anymore. Um, I would love to max out at like 70. Okay. That is plenty for a half marathon training cycle. Now, Mike is coming off experience running 70 to, I think your max was 85 miles before. My max was 90. Max was 90 before. So 70 is not a huge jump for him in any manner. It's actually a decrease from the maximum he's done before, but he is no longer in quite the same shape he was before. So it's a nice stepping stone to get back to that area if he wants to, or just to stay at 70 miles as his maximum for his training cycle, which is just fine. If you have run a maximum of say 40 miles in the past, then having a one cycle jump up to 70 would be highly discouraged because your body won't be able to handle that mileage well, you won't be able to recover well, and the injury risk is significant. A smaller jump say to 45 to 55 would be better. Now for long runs, do you have any idea what you want your longest long run to be? 18. Okay, we can do 18. It may not even hit 18. Okay, at this point, I have everything I need to create a training plan for you, along with the questionnaire that you filled out before we started taping. And from here on out, what I'm just gonna do is I'm gonna put these workouts up for you on Final Surge, and then we'll have weekly video chats to see how things went in the previous week and what your workouts are coming up so that we can talk about them. And then of course we can put it on YouTube so everyone can see how poorly you're doing. Sounds like an absolute joy for not just me, but everybody watching. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, thanks guys for tuning in for the first Descent Running YouTube video. For more content like this, hit the like and subscribe button and you'll get to see more of Mike in his training and his failures, which, you know, there's just going to be a mix of both. Um, oh, 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 failures. Oh, I'm going to try to avoid those. Yes, but you already did your little dance, so we can't take that back already. <laughs> Fair. Fair. All right, guys, we'll see you next week. That was kind of the motto on how you lived your life, right? Failure. Well, yeah, you are my friend. Ha 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 ha!